Good afternoon and welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers. Today is February the 13th. Uh, it's a little bit after 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I just want to say thank you all for joining us today. Um, today we're going to have a special guest on our meeting, uh, Mr. Brian Hilton. He's coming to us from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, he's going to be talking about human face and form and uh, carving large busts. Um, his Instagram page is Rough Cut Craft. So if you want to go out and check his, his work out, you can see it there on Rough Cut Craft. I uh, wanted to take a few minutes and thank you all again for uh, participating and supporting us through the Buy Us a Coffee uh, fundraiser that we've been doing to uh, make sure that we have enough uh, funds to be able to cover the Zoom classes or the, the Zoom um, subscription. I uh, want to remind everybody also that uh, all of the meetings are posted out on YouTube. Uh, so make sure you go on YouTube and like and subscribe our channel and uh, go out and watch the meetings that maybe you've uh, missed in the past. Uh, today's meeting will be posted sometime this evening. Uh, so if you uh, want to go back and review that, you're welcome to. Uh, I want to remind you, we also have a Teespring page. Um, we'll be posting some new merchandise out on our Teespring page. So if you want to go out and check that out, uh, just go to teespring.com and look up International Association of Woodcarvers. If you're not able to find that um, page there, let me know and I'll send you a link. I uh, just want to remind you also about a couple of classes coming up. Uh, Alec Lacoste has a class that's uh, starting on February the 17th. Um, it's on carving the wood spirit. Uh, he has a few openings for that. It's 11, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so if you're interested in Alec's class, make sure you reach out to Alec and get a spot there. Uh, Chris Hammock's doing ongoing classes. Uh, so make sure you contact Chris if you're interested in caricature classes through him. Uh, don't forget about uh, the upcoming class schedule um, through the Wood Carving Academy, and that's woodcarvingacademy.com. Uh, Dave Stetson is currently doing a dancing, dancing fiddler class. Uh, he'll have other classes coming up. He was just talking about it before the meeting here. Uh, Kevin Applegate's got classes. Uh, Janet Cordell is going to be doing a grizzly bear and a female bust. Uh, Ryan Olson has a hot tub, hot tub class that is closed now. Uh, we're hoping he's going to be doing some more classes coming up soon. Uh, Dwayne Gosnell has a pirate class. Del Green's doing a boomer caricature class. Bob Hershey is doing a surfing frog class. So uh, you can tell that there are several things that are coming up if you want to get involved or, get involved or participate in some classes. Uh, make sure you go to uh, check those out and reach out to those people individually so that you can sign up. Again, today we've got uh, Brian Melton on from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, Brian's also going to be doing a uh, giveaway during this meeting for Flex Cut. Uh, he's got a nine piece deluxe palm set that he's giving away as well as a slip drop that he'll be doing through Flex Cut. Uh, so we'll allow him to take care of that. Uh, and at this point, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Brian so that he can uh, talk to us about his carving journey and about his uh, human face and form carvings. Thanks, Brian. Well, how are you guys doing? Um, I'm used to I'm used to teaching. Let me change this over here. I'm like you said. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm used to teaching uh, kids. So teaching to adults, especially adults with a whole lot more experience than I have, is I'm not going to lie, guys. It's super intimidating. Um, so I'm just going to walk through some different things that I've picked up along the way. Um, Maybe some of that's non-traditional because I've only been in this carving game for less than two years now. I've only been carving for, for less than two years. But um, I'm like I said, guys, I'm super nervous, but let's just roll with this thing. And I am going to pretend like you all are a bunch of high school students. And um, I hope that doesn't come across as insulting. I hope it just comes across as me trying to cope with my own nerves here. Um, so... As, as we move forward today, I want to go over just a couple things. I want to talk to you about tools. I want to talk to you about different types of wood, um, some basic form hacks, the human face and human form, and then some different places where I go to get some inspiration. I'm looking at some of the carvings that I'm seeing in the backgrounds that you all have, and um, they're pretty amazing. So like I said, there may be things where you're like, ah, I wouldn't do it that way, or maybe you're looking at it and thinking, ah, that's, uh, that's the wrong way to do it. Um, but like I said, I've, I've only been doing this thing for less than two years now, so I've got a lot to learn myself. And in the Q&A time, if I don't know an answer to a question, I'm just going to look at you and tell you I don't know the answer to a question. Um, so 
I guess I want to start then by just talking to you about tools. I try to make do with what I've got. Now, along the way, I've been, um, the Lord has blessed me with just sponsorships from some different companies that I've gotten through Instagram that I am um, extremely thankful for. And a lot of the tools you see behind me, matter of fact, the vast majority of the tools you see behind me are, are a result of that. So um, I will be talking about flex cut today. And the reason why I, I want to specifically highlight flex cut too is that as a public school teacher um, and coming from an area where, you know, there's, I came from a really rural area and now I'm teaching in um, Knoxville. You, you see a lot of kids, you see a lot of people that, that may not have the ability to go out and buy the $80 chisel whenever they want something from um, good companies that offer great tools like file or something like that. But they might be able to go in and afford some of the tools that, that I'm looking at here. So that's one reason why I like to stick with FlexCut. They're good tools. They've worked fine for me. And they're at an economical price that people can afford. Um, so I'm just I'm just going to roll with it and start with probably my favorite type of handle. Whenever it comes down to these tools, I really love this ABS handle. They make different styles of the handle. They make them out of wood. They make them out of cherry if you get the deluxe sets. But I like this ABS handle because what I do is I turn it around backwards um, opposite the way that it's supposed to. Of course, the metal tool is detachable from it. And I like that reverse grip because it helps me to get a little bit more digging in. Um, my favorite blade style, especially for faces and things, is a double bevel skew. I, I don't know, this, this tool right here, I use it for everything from rounding out a cheek to even digging and contouring in certain places to point cutting in around eyes, lips. Um, and that tool right there is essential. So if you're somebody that is on a budget, he said that there would be some newer folks that would be joining these meetings. If you are somebody on a budget, these are some tools that can get you in the game without too much skin. So these ABS handles, they're pretty cheap. You can even buy a three pack of them and then you can buy the individual tools. I might recommend getting a double bevel skew. That's the tool that I probably use more than anything. Another style of tool that I really love is the thumbnail gouge. So if we look at the thumbnail gouge, it rises up high on both sides and then it sweeps down low. So as I'm setting in a face here or carving, I can dig, but at the same time, once I get to the side of that face, I can use that flat side like a number one and slide it through and help to even out some of that as I'm contouring back. So the skew, the thumbnail gouge, it's always nice to have something with just a moderate sweep. Anything from a five to a nine is great. Just whatever your preference is. And if you don't know, kind of meet it in the middle. And, and if it's all you've got, you learn to use it without any trouble. Um, knives, some of my favorite knives. I like this detail knife. It's got kind of a wonky handle. Now, that's... Um, there's been a lot of people that have been going out and they've been buying really expensive knives and things and, and they, um, they're spending crazy money on these knives, but these are like 23 bucks for, for these flex cut knives and they're, I'm telling you, they, they work just fine. Um, all of us that are carving have this stuff on our workbench, so if you are starting out and somebody's telling you, oh, you got to get filed, I look at them and say, that'll be fine whenever I'm old enough that I've got that kind of money and my house is paid off, but I'm not at that point yet. So um, let me just get in the game to begin with. But that tool right there is about 23 bucks. I also love the skewed detail knife. Again, a double bevel skew just in a very small knife. And I use this constantly for eyes and, and digging. Like anything that I use the skew for, it's just smaller. And then I also like that style knife right there. And I think it's called a skew something, something knife. I can't remember. But if you look at that blade, you'll be able to remember it, especially if this is recorded and you can go back to it. Um, another tool that I always keep and use in its various forms is just a regular rasp. One that's got the rounded side and the flat side, that thing, especially if you're just wanting to take off a, a small amount of material, because the thing with faces is it's so complicated, is if you're an eighth of an inch off on a on a bust where your where your main head shape is only going to be, 
I don't know, maybe like a six inch diameter or something like that, as far as the round ball before you get the jawline in. An eighth of an inch can mean a difference in whether it looks real or whether it doesn't look real. So sometimes you just want to take off a very little bit of material. Um, fine grit sandpaper, of course, that's not that's not only for sanding and getting it smooth. Some people like that rough look, and that rough looks really pretty, but sometimes you also want to bring it in and you want certain details to really be um, sanded down to where you can see the grain and that grain will pop. Um, I, I don't really like to mix the two and have a mixture of the of the deep gouges with the with the pretty sanding. Um, the floor pads are essential. I remember I went for my birthday and my wife, she bought me these beautiful gouges one time and it wasn't long and I dropped one of them. It slipped out of my hands once they got tired. I don't know if you all experience the same thing, but whenever you're using a mallet in, in a large gouge and you're going for a long period of time, those hands, they get tired, especially if you've hurt your hands in the past and you, I've already got arthritis sitting in mine and I dropped it and it went point first down on a concrete floor. Um, and, and I, I was, I was absolutely tore up about it. And then I just had to learn how to sharpen knives. And one thing that I use is that fine grip sandpaper. You all are going to maybe think I'm nuts for this, but you know these fine sanding pads that you can get? This one's about worn out and I've converted it over to wood. Once you get a lot of that worn off of there, where it's got that little bit of give to it, I love this thing. I can get a knife really sharp if I, as long as I'm using a gentle a gentle sweep in motion that doesn't come completely up over it. If I want to, if I've got a little bit of material I need to take off, I like these right here um, for sanding and sharpening. The hardest part for people beginning, it's not the carving, it's the sharpening. It's how do I keep my tools sharp? And this right here, and that's another thing I like about FlexCut too, is it's easier to sharpen than say a file. I've got some file up here. I've got some Stubai up here. But whenever it comes down to what I want to sharpen with, I, I prefer the flex cut tools. They're a little bit easier to sharpen. It's kind of like a difference in the old style um, solid tree brand boker knives and things like that. If you get one of the old ones that's, that the steel will turn black, um, you, can, you can sharpen that knife and they're, they're more sought after. But if you get one of the new stainless steel knives, it's, you can't hardly sharpen them unless you really know what you're doing. Um, now the file, of course, I don't think is stainless steel, but it it is it is a different type of steel, and I don't at least I think it is, and it is a little bit harder to sharpen. So if you are starting out, once you get some of the main grit off this, these things right here, they're 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 super great, and they'll help you out before then you go through with the leather strop, of course, and a compound. Um, this is probably my one of my favorite tools that I use constantly. It is not from FlexCut. This thing I think came from Lowe's. It is Project Source brand. And these are little bitty tiny files. These things cost you three bucks, I think, three or four dollars for all of them. I've only broken one since I've been using them and um, went out and got another set because at three or four dollars, I can replace them, especially if it's getting all that. Um, these things are great for if you're if you're contouring in around the nose and rising up to the nose and coming out around those eyes and sanding in those places and you just want to remove a little bit of material, three or four dollars. Those things right there are invaluable. I use them constantly. Um, and this again, non-traditional tool that you wouldn't think about using, but I love this thing and I use it constantly as well. This comes from Radio Shack and it is a soldering tool. It has a skewed end on that side, and I use it around edges to cut in, to scrape, to as I, as I carve down, and I've got those chips that, that are still connected at the bottom, I can cut them off with this. This will cut and scrape. I think I picked this thing up at a yard sale or something like that, and I use this thing all the time. You can get a whole set with the soldering tool for $13. I don't have much use for a soldering tool, but whenever it comes down to it, I'm not, I'm not mad that I had that soldering tool in, in, my, in my box. So um, the place in Knoxville did say they were on back order just a little bit, but that's encouraging because it means they still make it and eventually we'll be able to get them. But that right there, I'm telling you, I use it constantly and it cuts 
taking off material inside the eye sockets where it comes down to such a point. That thing right there is awesome because it's not so sharp that you got to worry about it diving too deep, but at the same time, it'll do what you want. And those things right there don't cost a whole lot. Um, another thing that I like to use as far as tools go and is this is an old cheap chisel that came from somewhere. I don't know. The chisel part of it's pretty useless, to be honest with you. But the part that I use is this little dowel. What I did was I drilled a hole in the dowel, and then I can mount my Dremel bits down inside of that dowel. And then as I go in here to carve on a face or something, let me turn this a little bit because that's, there we go. As I go in here, to, if I sit in my chair right without falling on the floor, if you were a bunch of kids, you'd be laughing at me right now. Um, <laughs> as I go in here, I can, I notice sometimes with a regular Dremel, it's a bit too aggressive, but I can get in here and work it like a pencil with that base on the back. And whenever I'm wanting to remove just a little bit of material, this thing right here is great. I use this thing all the time. Because like I said, a difference in an eighth of an inch to a sixteenth of an inch can mean the world. Um, just that little slight indentation around the mouth. If you want it to look realistic, you have to highlight that. So using something like this, I have more control than I do with something that's spinning at blue million RPMs where it might even catch and jerk on me and I have to worry about, oh crap, I just messed up my eye socket or something like that. Or I just ran up into my, into my eyebrow that I spent all that time making sure that it was carved away around it to where I could put in the, the brows themselves. Um, that right there, I, I absolutely love it. And Dremel bits are pretty cheap. You can pick those up at yard sales and different things like that with, without much trouble. But I use that constantly. Um, but with Dremel bits, they get lost. I don't care who you are. Whenever you get in the zone and whenever you're carving, and I don't remember to take every single tool the moment that I'm done with it and put it right back where it goes. You know, everything in its pl a place for everything and everything in its place. I don't do that whenever I'm whenever I'm really thinking about what I'm doing on a, on a carving. So if you could get one of those magnetic bowls, which I don't have one, but I'm going to go get one where you could drop those bits down in there and they just stick. You wouldn't lose so many of them because they're easy to get lost in wood chips. Um, I don't have a bandsaw. That's a tool that maybe one of these days I would love to have, but. I don't have a big shop. This is a little curtain that I put up separating off a little seven by 11 section of my garage. Um, and I painted the floor and I, and I painted the walls around it just to make it look like a, a workshop. Um, but I don't have room for a bandsaw. So one thing that I do use, it takes more time, but I use a coping saw. So if you're somebody, again, you don't have a ton of room or you're new to the game and you don't have the luxury of that nice bandsaw that sits in the corner that you can always rely on and go to something like that. It takes more time and, and, uh, takes a lot more elbow grease, but you can get through with a bandsaw. And then one of these Japanese style saws are great as well. Um, I love these. I got this on sale at Woodcraft and I use those things constantly because if I want to use a table saw, I have to pull it out to the, out to the, driveway to use it I don't I don't have I don't I just don't have the room in here same with my planer and things like that um another tool that I love is if you'll switch over to here is Howard's total vice now this thing has been a complete game changer another thing that has been difficult has been how am I going to hold my stuff still so with this vice it actually takes, this is a, it comes with multiple plates and this is a wood carver setup. This is a small American made company. Um, it fits down inside of here and then you can loosen it and tighten it after screwing that into your wood. And then as you tighten it or loosen it, you can spin your wood however you want, tighten it back. On the other side, there is another one and it will let it move all the way down with you. Come back up, there's a stop at the end. There is a safety guard that comes with it. But whenever I'm wanting to do something and, and I'm really having trouble getting in at an angle, I can quickly 
from down here or something like that come in and just sweep away at those various angles and look at it from different angles. And I'm telling you what, this thing right here has been a game changer. I've tried everything in the world to hold my stuff with while I'm working. Um, you can see before I had a vise, I was trying to use, you can see it up here at the top. I was using a bar clamp and then trying to screw it to the wall and doing all kinds of things, trying to hold my, my stuff still. But that vice right there, small American made company, Howard's Total Vice, and they've, they've been, they've also been a company that has been really good to me. Um, he's, he, he's a good guy. Um, he actually saw, I put on a little show for kids. Um, a buddy of mine that I used to teach with was doing a little summer camp for some kids, and one of the activities they were doing was carving. So I went up there and I put on a carving lesson, and then we carved apples. Um, I remember carving apples in elementary school, and they all brought their pocket knives, and uh, some of them brought two or three, but they were probably anywhere from eight to 10, 11 years old, maybe 12, and uh, he saw that post that my buddy put on about that, and, and I'd reached out to him to ask him about it before, and then once he saw that, he was like, I like that you're, that you're working with kids, and um, he, he sent me over this right here. Um, so whenever people do me good like that, I try to I try to be a good steward of what they've given me, and um, super good tool at a at a at a good price. But like I said, it's a small company; it's an American made company. What's and, the name of the company I'm again? Super proud of that. Howard's Total Vice. Howard's Total Vice, and they'll send you multiple plates, and they've got different knuckles that extend and reach out to where you can really get to it. Um, there are some YouTube videos online, some folks where they've done some stuff. Um, I will say this, if you've got one, especially if you're going to be beat on it hard with some of the big sculpting chisels, um, you probably want a good workbench. That's another thing I don't have the space luxury to have is a big sturdy workbench. So this is actually an old table, old craftsman table saw base that I've screwed a pallet on and it's sitting on that. So I do get a little bit of wiggle with it, but to be honest with the other than just annoyance from the sound of it it doesn't really bother me um but it, it is it's a great tool the stand that my computer is actually sitting on is a portable stand so if i'm doing smaller projects i can take it around if i went to like a, a craft show or something like that because it's it's also not real heavy all i gotta do is unscrew it and put it back on something you all get that <laughs> you're not wanting to tote around a bunch of stuff that weighs it, you got to be good to your back eventually. I, I went for year for several years with that whole, ah, I'll rest when I'm dead mentality. I actually heard that from somebody. I'll rest when I'm dead. Well, you'll rest and you can't move anymore. Um, that tends to be the case first. Um, but Howard Soto Vice, another thing is um, this work sharp sharpener. Now, I'm starting to get into money now, and I realize that, but that thing right there is pretty fantastic um this is a leather stropping wheel on top i need to i need to clean it just a little bit but that thing right there really speeds it up um i don't use the guard on it i got used to sharpening by hand before i started using this thing so that guard's kind of an annoyance for me because i kind of eyeball it there's a guy out of it no no i'm mistaken he's not out of italy he's out of I'm sorry, I can't remember where he is from. For some reason, I want to say Portugal. Um, Julio Leal Woodcarver. He does this ornate, beautiful architectural carving. And I watched his videos of, of him um, sharpening with stones. Now, let me tell you, he, he's a boss at it. He like, like, he's awesome. But I tried to mimic his style the way that he did it, which is a little bit different than the traditional way that a lot of people will teach you. But I did. I learned how to sharpen first by hand. So using something like this after that has has been a huge time saver in it, and it just it, it's it's really nice. Um, I actually heard that that Alec Lacasse and Nate Ellerton from um, Nate's Wood Sculpting on Instagram, and of course Alec Lacasse, they're they're doing a talk about carving a human face. Is that right? 
Um, but Nate's the one that got me turned on to using this. I, I tried all kinds of different things as far as to seal the wood afterward. And it turns out one of my favorite things, what Nate turned me on to, and that's lacquer. So I love just the lacquer spray that I can get in there in all those type places without having to dirty up a bunch of brushes. I know it's a little bit expensive for the spray, but it's kind of annoying having to throw away all those brushes or put them down in the stuff and keep them clean. I'm, where I'm still working full time and I'm not retired yet or this isn't my only job, I, I come out in the shop and work for an hour or two in the morning before I go to school. And then I come home after school and I'll put in time on Saturdays and things like that, early mornings. And, and the less time you can spend in cleanups, kind of nice. Um, wood glue, of course, you all, a lot of you guys know about this, but if you are somebody, I don't want to take it for granted that you already know this, but I love just this tight bond wood glue, this stuff right here. It, it'll it hold like crazy and, and I don't have to worry about it. I've, I've never had any type of problem with that and I've beat the far out of stuff. It's been glued with that without it without it coming apart. Um, and then of course, you can make your own mallet, especially if you're on a budget. But they, these wood is wood is good mallet. I love this thing. <laughs> it just it just feels good in your hand. Um, I don't know what this green stuff is on the outside, but whatever it is, it, it saves a little bit of the stress on your on your striking hand. Um, if that, if it's called a striking hand, like I said, guys, I've not been to a lot of these meetings myself, but I guess that term will work. You guys know what I'm talking about. But um, again, those are some tools. If you want to get in the game pretty cheap, just get you a couple things like an ABS handle and get you a thumbnail gouge and get you a, one of those double bevel skews. And and you can honestly do quite a bit with just and, and a good knife. And like I said, you can pick up a knife for 20, 25 bucks. You know, and, and you can get in the game without having to put a whole lot of money in there. But um, since we are talking about tools right now, if it's okay with you all, I'm just going to go ahead and do the drawing. So flex cut, they're constantly trying to get people in the game because one, if you go and you buy this, you're going to end up, you're going to get hooked on it and you're going to want more tools and, and you're going to keep adding your collection over the years. And they've offered to give away a super nice um, nine peaks deluxe palm set to somebody um and so i'm just gonna go ahead and draw for that now i guess i gotta close my eyes i can't draw with my eyes open can i but i've got all my names down here in in this little bucket and the winner of that is going to be I don't know if you all can see that. La Fidel. And so I'll get, I'll be in contact with you here in the next little bit to get your contact information. And um, this will actually be coming from the FlexCut factory directly. So once I get your contact information, I'll shoot it over to um, the person that I work with over there and she'll make sure that you get your tools. So um, again, guys, that was FlexCut giving away about $160, $170 um, wood carving set. And, and they're constantly doing stuff like that, giving stuff away and, and supporting people. And a company like that, American Made Tool Company, I mean, you all might like your file tools real, a whole lot, but I kind of like supporting an American Made um, American Made company. Now, I, I know it's International Association, but but there's, there's still a little bit of pride in some American tools. Um, so anyway, let me leave this out so I don't forget it. Um, which one it was. So now, now that we're um, good on that, another thing that I want to talk about, and and maybe I hope it wasn't misrepresented, and if so, that that was that was on that was my fault. A lot of what I'm doing here today is trying to work to make um, wood carving accessible to people that maybe maybe don't have a ton of money, you know. Um, so so that's the way I centered a lot of this around. I, I teach a little sponsor a little art club there at the school and we didn't have an art program before so I wrote a grant to get the art supplies so it's one of those things where I do want to make sure that kids and and young folks and older folks you know fixed incomes the same as somebody being young you know it's 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 six and one half a dozen of the other I want to I want to try to get stuff in people's hands 
to where to where they can do this because it, it gives me a lot of enjoyment and you meet a lot of good people through it. But um, another thing that we come into as far as people on a budget goes is how do I find wood? Wood is so damn expensive. Um, and I'll be real honest with you, found wood is great wood. So lately, to prepare for this thing, I've been trying to carve the awfulest trash that I could find. And I figured if I can carve this awful trash, then then anybody can go out there in any plot of woods or something like that, and they can find something. So I've been working on this little guy lately, and he's from a holly root that I got over at my sister-in-law's place. And then I found this old dried piece of, I have no idea what it is, but it's a, one of those twisted things that I carved me a little face in that um, the other day. And this is one I took my kids. When I say my kids, I'm talking about my kids at school. Um, I took my kids on a walk and I found this piece of a root and I'm going to try to do something with that piece of a root. Um, and it's, it's a mess right now. I need to clean it up for a, put any 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 type of blade into it and i'll probably take a dremel to it and clean that thing on up but guys if you can find your wood some of this more crazy looking stuff is the stuff that might actually sell really well this is another thing that i picked up and salvaged this is a project i'm pretty proud of um it's a face that i just carved in an old pine knot and you hear about pine knots being so tough but I really like this. I, I'm, I think I'm going to start looking for more of these things. It's been sitting there for a while, and I thought, oh, I'll make a bowl out of that. But I really like the way the character, the um, figure came out in it. Um, so I might do some more of that. But found wood is one of those things where it has a little bit more, has a little bit more character. You don't need a, a planer or a joiner to get it to where you can glue it, glue it up. Um, and you can, you can kind of just look at it and it feels a little bit more natural sometimes. Um, another thing you all might start throwing stuff at me. So if there's any rotten apple to be thrown, I'm kind of happy there's a computer screen. But another thing that I really like is my wife is sending me a note. Yes, ma'am. Um, so... She, she shoot me some advice she'll tell me how to do this thing and you know what i'm just better listen to it um another thing that like i said you all might start throwing stuff at me but i like to carve pine pine is probably the most accessible wood people talk about how it's how it's hard to finish and how you can't get a good finish with it i i, I look up and i research people all the time and i and i look at different things and some of the most beautifully finished work that i've seen is out of pine so one, and it's soft. I'm telling you, you guys like basswood. You carve pine, it's like carving butter, okay? It, it's easier to carve pine than it is basswood or lime wood, whatever you all call it. But this is one of my first projects and we talked about doing bigger busts. But this one is John Henry. And so I put his hammer here in the middle. Now there's some obvious defects on the face where I was starting out and didn't know. Um, but I put these lines all through his arm to represent kind of the CNC machine because John Henry's whole whole deal was he wanted to beat the machine. So for us traditional wood carvers, the equivalent of that is this modern day CNC machine where you use a computer to do your carving. Now, if you're a CNC carver and you're on here, bless your heart. I don't, I don't mean I don't mean to throw sticks and stones at you, but um, there's something to be said for the traditional style. And, and that's what this figure was supposed to represent. And I had, a, I had a blast carving him. Now, like I said, the face is a little bit wonky because I didn't know that whole principle about the nose sitting halfway on the face that we'll talk about here after a bit. Um, so you can see that that nose is slapped on there really weird like. And um, that, that's a different story, but I'm telling you, pine is great. I did a self-portrait in pine and it was coming out really well until I went and it was coming out great until I messed it up, but it wasn't the wood's fault. It was the user error. And now his nose is looking a little bit weird and wonky because I also just didn't know that at the time then. Um, another good thing is roots. Like I said, I, I carved some roots, and I think roots are going to be really fun moving forward, especially like if you're going to set up the craft shows and stuff like that. Cottonwood bark. The first time I carved cottonwood bark, I had paid for a lesson um, with Alec LaCasse one time whenever we were up in Michigan. I'm telling you, cottonwood bark, it's it's kind of expensive and hard to get unless you live up in an area where you can go harvest your own. But it is really nice, and it's got a lot of character to it. Um, basswood, of course. Anything green will carve. 
you can carve up. I accidentally knocked down a gum tree the other day whenever I was falling um, trees at my sister's house and turns out she really liked that gum tree. So I carved a, a quick wood spirit that I got to go back and finish up. And even old gum that you think about, I wouldn't, I remember my grandpa brought me a bunch of, brought home a bunch of gum one time. And of course it was my job to split grandma's wood. And um, <laughs> I think whenever I'd hit that thing with a ball, it'd just laugh at me. Uh, it just bounced off. But even that, if you're using a sharp chisel, you can carve that. So anything green and some woods that I avoid. Now, again, like I said, you often throw apples and things like that if you want. But purple heart, I'd rather take a beat in this car, purple heart. <laughs> that thing's got so many splinters in it that it's, it's, and it's hard. You can't hardly get a chisel through it, even when it is sharp. Um, especially after it's been kiln dried and maple. They're, maple is one of those things where once that maple, it, it's tough. You, you have to sharpen even a chainsaw blade fairly often if you start trying to carve maple a whole lot. But that's what I had to say about um, wood. We talked about tools, talked about wood. Um, now I guess it gets into some basic form hacks and then we really start to get into the spirit of this thing as advertised and look at the look at the way that we set up and work out a face where you're not making errors like I made on Mr. Henry over here. Um, so let me get a quick drink. Now this is going to, I'm actually going to turn, I've got two cameras here. I've got one over here and then I've got my computer screen. So I'm going to show you one of my hacks real, real quick. So you can see my face here from the side. And if I turn this around, you can see it on my, if you will, um, sir, will you please switch that over to where it's showing from? Well, that's fine. So just say that there's a face right here and you look up an image of a face. What you can do is take a piece of copy paper and you can lay it over the top of that computer screen and you go in a dark room and you turn your brightness up. Most computer screens nowadays, um, they're not rounded like they used to be. So if, if you do that right there, you can see the outline of what you're carving. You just tape that thing on there and you just trace that outline. You take a razor or a good knife and you cut around it. And then you can draw that form, the rough form straight onto your wood. So if you're doing a shallow or bass relief carving, you can get almost perfect form without any trouble. I, or if you're doing wood burning or py pyrography, uh, you, you can, you can get a really great form on there where all you got to do is go back in. And, and let me tell you, it's, it's that fast and you don't have to have some big art degree or a whole bunch of art experience to do it because all of us can trace, you know? So if somebody's trying to want, you're wanting to break out into commissions. One of the things that people are nuts about me included is, is my dog. So people will want you to like wood burn and different thing on dogs well i did a cutting board for a lady where i was able to make her australian shepherd look exactly like her australian shepherd and that's the technique i used or if you're wanting to know where the where the terminating points are and if you want to create an exact likeness that's one of those quick little hacks that you can do um another thing is as you start to carve you quickly notice well my lines went away so if you're carving like straight on or something like that and, and you're wanting that, that exact face to be in there, one thing you can do is once that paper's printed out or you've drawn that basic line drawing like with a, like what I did with Elisa here, you know, you, you get your basic line and this was done through that. Um, you, those lines go away quickly, but what you can do is you can take shish kebab sticks and it takes a little bit of time, but if you lay those shish kebab sticks out, right across those points, like where the brow line is, where the eye line is, where the sides of the nose are, um, where the mouth is. And, and you glue those things together, tape those things together. As you're carving, you can lay it up there and it makes a quick reference to where you can go back and say, wait, I'm getting a little bit off here. I'm taking a little bit too much off over here. And I found that to be super helpful, especially with bigger things where you're trying to create a, a human-like likeness. Um, now, this may not be the way to do it, but like I said, a lot of this stuff I've tried to figure out 
along the way, like many of you all have with a lot of your little tips, secrets, hacks, whatever you want to call them. Um, another thing that you can do, and, and this is this is pretty neat, if you go up to Hobby Lobby, I think this is for hairdressers. You can get a bust of a person that looks fairly realistic, and it's got the right proportions as far as, well, fairly right, as far as like where ears and stuff go for, for just a general figure. And you can use this right here to as a reference. So if you're looking at it, so say I'm I want this, I just turn it the same way, and I'm looking at it from a different angle. And as I'm trying to get those basic planes of the head that we'll talk about later in place, I can look at it from those different angles and make sure that as I'm roughing it out, that I'm in line. But Hobby Lobby bust, now I will say this: the one that they have of the man is pretty good. The one that they have of the woman is I, I don't know what happened here, but they somehow made her look like an alien. So maybe if you went somewhere else, you might be able to get one that's that actually, I mean, this looks great if you're looking for abstract kind of work, but I've said before, abstract kind of is, kind of sucks if abstract is not your goal. Um, so uh, I don't take that for what it is. The, the one of the man, it, it's a little bit from Hobby Lobby, at least is, is pretty easy to use and it's super helpful. I don't know why I picked that one up because I never use it. Um, but they're, I don't think they're very expensive. I think they're maybe five or $10 to get one of those things. And then you can, then you have a constant reference because I don't know if you all have ever tried this, but, um, have you ever tried to get somebody to come and sit out in your cold wood shop in your garage so you can look at them for three hours? Most people aren't too excited about that. My own wife is like, Brian, there is no way I'm sitting out there in your shop so you can look at me car. <laughs> but um, that, that, that is that's super helpful. Another thing that, that is, is really helpful. Say again, buddy. Another thing that's really helpful is action figures. Sometimes you can get some pretty neat action figures. And I've seen some, some carvers that use action figures and kind of look at those. What do they call them? A little, um, I can't remember what they call them. I, I want to say vignette, but vignette's not the right word. Is it? I don't know. I, I, I can't remember. Um, they, they, a lot of people that are doing like big stuff, like the beat holes, um, whenever he's carving, he, he'll rough it out and he'll use a little tiny clay figure and he'll look back and forth at that rather than to have a live figure sitting in, in your garage all the time because anybody can come sit in your garage all the time. Um, so action figures are one of those things that you can look at too and get some basic proportions down and, and, and they're pretty neat. Um, another thing that as far as working to achieve realism in the face, and I've shown you some of my bad examples but i don't think i've shown you my first example okay so i was so proud of this guy when i got him done about a year and a half ago all right can you all see him look at that and all that beauty look at that right there look at that ear look at the way that ears plays isn't that gorgeous i was so proud of this man i thought i was doing a great job believe it or not different tool companies were sitting there sharing it on their face saying it looked like me now Come on, come on, give me a little bit more credit than that, guys. It wasn't supposed to be me. Um, but you see how it, he's kind of weird and wonky and none of the proportions are right? Well, I tried to just do him from my head. And Norman Rockwell, I've, I've been on and off because I don't, I don't concentrate very well. Norman Rockwell said that you need to be able to, to draw or paint a person realistically from your brain before you start using references. Um, kind of like, I think it's the old principle of you need to learn to hand sharpen your tools before you start using power sharpeners just to kind of get a feel for it. So most of us can't from our brain come up with stuff because our eyes play trick songs. Um, I'm an English teacher and I see this all the time. I know I don't sound like an English teacher when I talk all the time. I don't have to use a proper register all the time. That's annoying um, and kind of pretentious sounding. But um, when it, whenever you think about an email or, or professional correspondence and 
I can read my own email six times and it looks just right. And then I send it and it's got a typo in it. And I've read over those same words over and over again. But our brain will play a trick on us because our mind, our eyes will see what our mind believes is there. Does that make sense? I know that sounds kind of silly. But so we see it and we're often, our mind is manipulated because we're thinking like for the eye, for instance, it's supposed to sit about halfway between the head. Well, we, we don't think about that, especially if you got all this mess that I have on my face and it looks like my eyes are sitting way up at the top of my head. So you'll see a lot of carvings and they'll have their eyes clear up here. And then it, then it doesn't look realistic. So one thing that you can do is um, there's a Riley method and there's a Loomis method for drawing. I've always liked to draw. It helped keep my attention whenever I was in school and couldn't pay attention otherwise. Um, or I could listen better to the preacher whenever I was sitting there doodling. Um, and I learned this whenever I was, whenever I was little. Um, but I, I did, I always liked to draw, but this, I kind of think of carving as drawing in, three, in 3D. So if the Riley method or the Loomis method, what, what it'll do is it'll take a basic shape and you can look it up because I, I have to reference it myself and you draw a circle and then you bisect your circle, you draw a line down the middle of it and then you divide that into certain points. Some, one method will say divide it into thirds, one method will say divide your main circle in half and then take that top half and divide it in three, take that bottom half, divide it in three, and then add a third down here is another way of doing it. it it's, it essentially achieves the same result. One is more about the planes of the face, the basic, um, if you look at planes of the face, hyperbolic, um, exaggerated flow of the face it, is, it might be a way to, way to describe that. Um, it's an exaggerated flow of the face. And for clay carvers where they're adding two additive, added or clay sculptors, excuse me, adding to something, you can, you can get down to those basic planes first. Now with us, we kind of have to see that and just understand that that's an exaggeration. But the Riley method or Loomis method, as far as like looking up something to research, you can Google that really quickly and come up with some stuff and you can watch a video and draw along with them the way that you would like an old Bob Ross painting show. And then you can really start to get an idea of how the, how the head legs. Um, that has been something that's been super helpful to me. And I've been trying to, to draw more from, from my head. And, and, and as I practice it, it, it's becoming easier over time. Um, then, of course, there's some other folks. And I'm going to shout some people out for a second. Um, one guy that I love to follow. Um, now, if you're one of my students watching this, um, just, just talk to your parents before you go and even have your parents with you, especially if you start looking up sculpture stuff, because a lot of that stuff, it, it's people that are artists, they like to, to figure out the human form entirely, in its entirety, okay? So there's no sense in looking at stuff that you should, that, that you get what I mean, okay? Have your parents around and, and talk with your parents. Um, but one person that does a really great job of, of teaching and also sculpting is a guy by the name of Rick Casali. And he's got some great YouTube videos. One video in particular, um, he talks about the planes of the head. And I've watched that video over and over again as he's talking about the basic, like I said, the basic flow. Now it's, hyper, it's, it's an exaggerated flow of the face, but as he's talking about that, Rick Casali's work, um, you can YouTube it. He's also on Instagram. Um, he, he's been a huge help and he's a really good guy. One of those guys that'll reach out and talk with you. Um, and he also teaches classes and some different things for like um, some, some prestigious, like, like dudes doing some good work. Um, another person, of course, is Alec LaCasse. Um, can't say enough good about him. Um, his work is just phenomenal, the way that he sees it um, and the way that he interprets, especially on a small scale, because we had mentioned talking about big stuff, but whenever you're carving on a small scale the way he is, it's a little bit more complicated. I think it's harder to carve small than it is carve big. It just takes less time um, because you, you're not, you don't have as much, at least in the rough out period, 
um, it takes more time because you don't have as much wood to remove. Um, but even on that small scale, he's achieving some some ridiculously amazing results. Um, I've got a quick question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you spell uh, Rick Castali? Castali, it's R I C K C A S A L L I. Thank you. I got real spaghetti when I uh, looked that up. So that's a lot better. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think it's two L's. I'm not 100% sure if I'm seeing that right. So it's gracious. It's small. Yeah. Um, but then Alec Lacasse and Lacasse, guys, most of you probably know him, but if you're just starting, you may not. Um, it's L A C A S S E. Um, and then another person, his name, I don't know. He, he's, he's, you can tell I'm used to working with kids. Okay, I got to get down here whenever I go to explain something. <laughs> um, it's Barack, um, B U. R A K G E C G I L L Brock Gill, I think B U R A K G E C G I L L dot art. So Brock Gill, Brock Gill dot art. Um, he's on Instagram. He shows tons of videos where he's actually drawing out the face from scratch. And I've learned so much by watching his videos, especially about the lips and the nose and the way that those slant in. Um, his, the, the way that he draws those things, it's, it's, just, it's just really pretty the way that he draws his stuff um, while still obtaining a realistic look that kind of looks, gives you that, that Marvel comic at, esque vibe that you would see from old school Hasbro but I'm telling you his work he, he'll sit there and he'll draw it from scratch and that's what he does and and I'm telling you you can learn so much from watching his stuff I, I, I watch his stuff quite a bit another person that's super inspiring James O'Neill Wood Art I don't know if you guys know James O'Neill uh, he is he, 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 he sculpts athletes and um people like that um right now he is working on i don't know the guy's name he was one of those mr universe guys or whatever um but he's done like portraits of arnold schwarzenegger muhammad ali um different different athletes and i'm telling you his work is phenomenal and he is another self-caught top guy that works a day job and he just goes into his shop with a chisel and does it the old fashioned way. And his work comes out looking exactly like his Dwayne Johnson that he made a while back. You looked at it and you knew exactly who it was whenever you saw it. And he, the good thing about him is for, for somebody who's studying like I am, um, you look at it and he shows you the process all along the way. So you can really catch okay this is kind of step one step two if you just watch his process all along the way a lot of people just want to show you their end result because they paid a whole lot of money for an expensive art degree um but some of us who who haven't done that um we go and you know we've learned from others so we like we like to also reciprocate that and give that back um but james o'neill is super great david holes is another person that you can look up now i know i'm supposed to be the one that's presenting here and here I am talking about all these other people but to be honest with you I, I know full well that I've got room to grow myself so sometimes pointing somebody to the person that does have the answer is the best thing that you can do for them um and and it would be deceptive of me to try to act like I've got it all together um <laughs> so David Holes and it's D-A-V-I-D-E-H-O-L-Z um he just got through with the carving of the of the 12 apostles it was just unbelievable um and he shows the rough outs along the way and the way that he sculpts in the basic planes and forms um his work is ridiculous george bridgman you guys have probably heard about george bridgman he's like norman rockwell's teacher um which sorry that one has a lady on it 
But um, there, this one over here. Um, heads, features, and faces. Like some of these books. Now, I'll be honest with you. Like he's he's got some good concepts in here, and but his work is a little bit hard to, for me to follow. Um, somebody like Barack Seguil probably got inspiration from him. You know, a lot of the artists have, but Bridgman is a little bit hard to follow, a little bit hard to retain. Um, I like this book right here, and I found it at McKay Used Books and Lifelike Heads by Walter Foster. This book has all kinds of great resources in it. Now, it's for drawing, but essentially it's got a lot of the same stuff. It'll show you the planes of the head. It'll it'll give you troubleshooting guides. It'll give you proportions. Um, it'll it'll give you diagrams of ears and how those ears are supposed to look and the placement on those. It'll give you eyes and where the fat deposits are and different things to avoid. Like this is right, this is not. This is like like things like this. Like like for instance, it'll say correct and then wrong and wrong as far as your placement goes. So like I said, if on, on, on a figurative piece, if you're an eighth of an inch off, you might as well be a world apart because it doesn't look real at that moment. And then as you keep studying it, one thing that I do too is I get an app and I'll take a picture of my carving and I'll set it right this and I'll take another picture of my reference from the same angle and I'll paste them side by side and I'll look at them side by side until I can figure out what it is. And sometimes you just take off that little sliver and it's like, it all comes together just like all of a sudden um but that book right there is super great and it's from walter foster i bet you can get it on by lance richland um you can get it on on amazon or something pretty cheap i bet um and then another and then i'm going to talk about this maybe later oh i don't think i need to right now i can skip it so I guess as far as if, if we if we start looking a little bit more into the face and that human form more specifically instead of just other resources where you might be able to go and get some answers and, and to work from it. Um, let, let's just let's just start actually looking at it from from just some things that I've picked up along the way now, um, rather than me point you to the other folks. Um, so one thing that I notice is is I've been talking to you about formulas. And, and now I'm going to sound a little bit like I'm contradicting myself because formulas are great and formulas are a good, good concept. And, and once you understand those formulas, they will then help you to help complement what you see with your eye. But if you can get to the point where you can, where you can see it and, and do it, see it, draw it, see it, carve it, and, and just use it from an observational standpoint. Like whenever I taught myself how to draw, um, some, of my, some of my better stuff is not my woodworking. Some of my better stuff is my actual drawings. I would use my eye, I would use the person's eye for a measurement tool, and I would use a pencil, and I would measure it around. But observation, like most people's actual faces don't follow the exact rules like one for me you can't see this but i've got a little bit of an overbite so my chin is not going to be the same as somebody with an absolutely perfect um perfect teeth line where it like meets right where it's supposed to um some people might have more fat in certain places things like that and different things are, are going to make a face a little bit different so if you're trying to achieve an actual likeness you really have to get to the point where you, you can look and you can observe. And, and at that point, you, you kind of have to say, okay, I know what the rule says and I know the rule. So the, then I can now break it. It's kind of like writing. I teach my kids to write a formula essay and that formula essay is great. But if you really want to move to that next level, you also got to be observant. Um, and, and so observation is the key. And then you let the formulas then that you learn and, and kind of gain a knowledge of, you let that complement as you, as you move forward. Um, we talked about how the mind is more powerful than the eyes though. So you do have to be careful with that. And sometimes you just have to take a step away and come back to something or something that, um, I think it's Al Klikas that told me this. Um, if you, yeah, I think 
if you turn something upside down and you look at it, you can start to see symmetry, which is great if the face that you're looking at is supposed to be symmetrical. Many faces, however, are not symmetrical. Like whenever I smile, like, see, like this side rises up more. I know I'm exaggerating it right now, but you know that crooked smile, it, it probably has something to do with the way my jaws lined up or, or something like that. So some people aren't gonna have a perfectly symmetrical face. So that's great. On, because some parts of a face need to be symmetrical, but then if you're really trying to make an exact likeness, as you flip it upside down, just keep in mind, okay, I, I know that that's off and I've got to be okay with that because that's a reflection of the person that I'm working to, to create a likeness of. Um, I said this to a student the other day and it kind of comes from the idea of a Mark Twain quote, but i had been pondering that for quite a while. And I told um, that young man that your weak best is better than your strong intentions. So a lot of people will, will start and if they're not good at something, they'll throw in the towel and they'll give up. Um, back to my most beautiful face over here. It, it's one of those things where if I sat there and dreamed of it and never did anything about it, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking to you right now for one, but I wouldn't have had all the enjoyment of it. So sometimes just getting in there and trying and allowing yourselves to make mistakes. There's this whole silly trend of people taking their mistakes and, and, and they want to burn it. Like they, they make these videos of them destroying their work. I don't know why you would want to do that after you've spent so much time working hard on it, other than they some people have the idea that if, if it's not good, that it's a reflection of you as an artist and, and you want to set yourself apart as somebody that's good at what they do. Well, everybody's got to start out, you know? So looking back at something like this face I've got down here, I, I can learn from my mistakes if I, if I, if I look back at it. And, and then I can see where I've been and see where I don't want to go back to, if that makes sense. Now I'm, I'm not here to preach a sermon, but, um, and that started sounding a little bit like that, but um, I'm talking about wood carving in this in in that respect. You know, it, it's okay to make those, and we're all going to make the mistakes, especially as we're learning. And shoot, far two years in, I'm making mistakes constantly. I'll show you poor Dolly over here. I'd work for. I don't guess I'm just going to show you all my mistakes. <laughs> I've been working on trying to carve a likeness of Dolly Parton. Okay, can you all see her right there? This was supposed to be Dolly. Well, I could not get Dolly's face right. I tried and tried and tried, and I worked for a month on this little old piece of pine here. And I ended up making her kind of look like a woman because I was like, I can't make it look like Dolly. No matter what I'm doing, she is not looking the same. So, and being from Tennessee and with her reading initiative that she's done and her music, you know, there, there's a lot of respect for Dolly around here. So you don't want to say, hey, this is Dolly, and it looked not look like Dolly, okay? Somebody might punch you in the eye. Um, so I, I did, I, I just tried to make it look like a woman's face after that, and, and that was one of my attempts that was talked up, and people were looking forward to it, and I felt like it was a failure. But you still got to push yourself, and you still got to challenge yourself. I, I know one guy that he's, he was carving about the same time I started, and um, I used to look at his work in – and 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 get take a lot of inspiration from it but i noticed over time that he kept only doing the same thing over and over and over again and he was never getting any better and and the same mistakes that he was making a year and a half ago he's just continuing with it and i don't know if it's you just got to be able to look at it and learn and understand that that you're not going to be perfect and I'm a prime example of that you know I've, I've got tons of mistakes sitting behind me back here but you look at it and you analyze it and you ask people for feedback and one person um I think it was maybe Marty Dolphins um or maybe Don Blackwell I can't remember um gave me some advice one time on on a face and finally helped me figure out how to carve a nose you know that whole idea of the nose sits halfway on the face that is the most confusing expression I've ever heard in my life. If I said that in a classroom, I would have a bunch of students that were completely off. 
Okay. This, that, that, you know how people would always tell, say that, well, the nose sits halfway on the face. And I was like, okay, I can do that. So I'm looking, the bridge of the nose is part of the nose in my mind. So I was looking and I was like, okay, the bridge of the nose is back there. And I was thinking the bridge of the nose is back there and the front of the nose is off. I didn't think about it being the nostrils sitting back up on a wedge shaped lip and that the nostrils are sitting back on the lip line. Um, but anyway, that might be a little bit off topic and we might come something like that later on. But here I am working, squatted down again. Like I said, I'm just working with kids. Um, Another thing that learning the basic planes of the head and those exaggerated, those exaggerated forms and flow um, is, is a great compliment. And you pair that with observation and forcing yourself to, to be observant and try to make what you see come out. Um, there's a book called Drawing on the Left Side or Right Side of the Brain. I, I can't remember what it is, but I've heard that book's good for it. I, I've never read the book, but it's kind of that same principle, I think, is what I'm getting at. Um, another thing is whenever you're carving likenesses is that you've got a skull underneath all this pretty stuff that you see, all this all this skin and hair and stuff like that. Um, but there's a skull underneath there. So you're going to see where the where the skull protrudes in some places. And, and understanding that is also helpful. Like, once you start to carve in and, and acknowledge that there is a um, bone right here where this where the nose bone tapers back, you know, into the skull and knowing where you're going to have indentations and where those indentations stop is also going to be something that's helpful to your carvings. Um, and a lot of like the Riley method, Loomis method, et cetera, they, they help with that. Um, another thing that I see is is as far as now, I know this sounds like a lot. Um, whenever I do trainings for other teachers and things like that on like how to write essays or how to how to help kids with disabilities or whatever it might be, um, whenever I'm putting on a training for teachers, what I try to do is is I try to give them as many resources as I can possibly give them. Um, and, and and I guess that's what I'm doing here. So if it if it feels like he's just dumping a bunch of stuff, that's usually that's usually my mo. Whenever I'm whenever I'm putting on a presentation, I just want to give you tools that you can use. Um, so I, I hope that's okay. Um, but one thing that I've also noticed is that a lot of your the, your resources don't factor in um, people of non-European descent. Um, it seems like all the resources that I see here for carving either um, they're for carving white folks, okay? So, so uh, let, 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 let's just let's just cut to it. Um, and like my wife is Korean, I went to carve her face. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna try to carve my wife or or a portrait of somebody, I want to be able to carve people. I, do, I want to be able to go on and I want to see a face that I think is is interesting or beautiful or whatever. And, and I don't want to just be, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to be limited to what the old guys from the past have, have done. Um, they've done some great work and their, and their forms are beautiful. And you look at things like the idyllic sculpture of David or something like that. And, and that's the kind of work that people were wanting to do, but, um, it is really hard to find good pictures of um, and, and good sculpting resources for for people who are not white. Um, and, and the same with women. It, it's hard to find good resources and pictures and, and things for for um, a lot of what you see is are pictures of of, of men, too. Um, and, and there's a difference there. Now, I'm not going to talk about the, the, the gen generally speaking, okay, generally speaking, of course. Um, I'm not going to talk about the differences between the male and the female face here in this lesson because, not because I don't want to, but to be honest, um, that's, that was the main topic of discussion whenever I went and paid for a lesson with um, Alpha Cast, and, and, I, and I had him kind of help me navigate through how to make a female's face look like 
a female face, generally speaking. Okay, of course. Um, and and I paid for that lesson, and that's part of the way that that man makes his living. So I don't feel like it would be appropriate for me to go and and to give you what what he makes his living doing. If 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 y'all are with me, um, but you can look up tons of different resources on different differences between the male and the female face and and generally speaking and and kind of see how you could how you could troubleshoot along the way um some resources i think this has got a little bit in it about like other ethnicities and and carving other ethnicities um that's kind of nice that's in there but just keep in mind that as you are working to carve the face of of not all your formulas that you see online are, are going to fit with the with maybe a character of someone's face um, or a characteristic, I guess you could say, of someone's face. Um, another thing is that there are muscles underneath the face and you're going to see those. And that's another reason why I like these dribble bits, because as you see, like the that rounded muscle that goes around the lips, you can get in there. And you can carve that in once you get it down to that basic point. And you can just make a very fine indentation just to show the hint that that's there. And, and that that it will take what you're doing and, and bring it to life. Okay, getting in those, those little features. Um, there's, of course, fat on a face. If, if we're looking generally speaking here, um, this does not work with Asian cultures. Um, generally like i'm gonna quit saying that you all know what i mean okay um but you're gonna have roughly a 45 degree angle from the nose back to the cheek line as you're rough and in um that's that's with someone of european descent but i'll show you my portrait of my wife um this is one that i that i've done fairly recently by fairly recently last spring okay the face is a little bit more, more flat on, on the front. The, the side planes of the face are not as pronounced with, with some um, Asian ethnicities. And, um, and there's, some, there's some others, but that's, it's, it's like for things like that, like if you get commissioned to do something, you can't necessarily just pay attention to what the formulas say. You, that's when you have to rely on observation because the formulas were not designed for those basic formulas were designed for European descent. Um, so that's that's one of those things that you might keep in mind depending on depending on what you're what you're carving. Um, I've always heard that the that the um, eyes are on the center line of the head as far as top to bottom goes. Now you can't see, I'll, I'll actually show you my, where my real chin is. Um, the eyes are right there in the middle. Um, and, the eye, and the head will be, some people say four, some people say five, eyes wide. And you should be, able, the main thing is you need to be able to get an eye in the center. And if it's stylized, your eyes might be a little bit bigger. Um, or if you're doing a caricature, the eyes might be a little bit bigger. But five, Eyes wide as a as a rule has always served me well, um, but I've been seeing more about like four eyes wide with kind of half an eye on each side, and that's something that I personally want to research myself right now. Um, the lips, some people are going to have an overbite, so this bottom lip will oftentimes tuck up under, and the lips won't be perfectly perfectly squared off right there. There, there might be a little bit of a, there might be a little bit of a slant to the mouth if somebody, especially if they have a little bit of an overbite and just acknowledging that that, that variance from that picturesque David might be there is gonna help your carving come across as more realistic. And you have this little, let me show you on him because you can actually see it on him. You see how he's got this little, little dimply area that comes up underneath there talking about those planes of the head I just took that Hobby Lobby model and I drew some of those basic planes in here on one side and then I left the other side clean um, as I use that for reference um, the lips one thing that I really like to do is as I'm cutting in those lips 
I like to cut in a stark line for those lips and not do too much sanding on it. So even around this edge of the lip here, I'll finish it because you can see that line, but you won't. There's a video by National Geographic of a of a carver by the name of Anna Rubincom. And she's a stone carver. And it's one of the most inspiring videos I've ever seen in my life. Like anytime that I want some inspiration, I'll go and I'll watch that video of Anna Rubincom taking a piece of marble and carving a face from it. Um, and, and one of her base, what, the title of the video, I think is called A Continuous Shape. And, and they talk about how that face is kind of a continuous shape and you don't see any lines on the face. Unless, of course, you've got like a, a set wrinkle for an elderly person or something like that. You don't see any lines where, where those facial features are. You'll just have a slight undulation or something like that that'll, that'll show you that there's a transfer from one muscle to the other or, or something like that. That's why I like this, because as you come in here, it doesn't show you those those specific lines that don't really exist, you can come in here and you can round something out um, and, and really get some good detail with that. But um, whenever it does come to the lips, I do like to, instead of like carving a line around it, like lips aren't gonna look right. I like to come in from that basic plane of that mouth and then just drop in, in at an angle to really get that show that contrast there as that lip comes in and it comes out looking really pretty. Um, and then you've also got some fatty deposits. You've got a fatty deposit right there in the middle of the lip. And then you've also got some fatty deposits over here on the, on the side of the lip that will kind of come down. And, and on some people I tried to, I, I carved a, it came out pretty good. A um, full size bust of the Hobbit, Sam Gamgee. So it was 38 inches tall. And it's sitting in my classroom right now, but uh, I didn't want to haul it. It is heavy. So it's sick of more and it's not quite dry yet. Um, but he had like a lot, like, like a pretty pronounced fat deposit right here. And it was so hard figuring out how to get his mouth right and to make his mouth look the way that it was supposed to look. And I'll be honest with you, at the end of the day, I, I felt like that was one of the failures on that carving was that I didn't get the mouth the way that I wanted to. I had a little bit too much of a gap right here. Um, but with lips, stark line coming in, fatty deposit here, tucks in here. There'll be a, a depression right there. And then of course there'll be depression coming up right at those corners of the mouth. And, and just generally speaking, the corners of the mouth are gonna come right down halfway in between the pupil. Um, and by watching those videos, it might just reinforce what I'm saying here. Um, the nose, this is one of the things that the quickest way to mess up a carving is to get carried away with the nose. You don't want to core out the nose while you're still working on the face. I saved that to very last because you inevitably, I'll carve in where the nose is supposed to be. So this is a roughed out face and, and, I, and I left it this way for this. So if I turn this over here, you can kind of see them. And you can see kind of the basic planes of the face drawn in. Well, whenever you're trying to achieve a realistic carving here, let me move this over here to where you all can see it a little bit better. Okay, can you all, let me move I got back. Okay, so as you see this and, and as you want to carve that face, getting that roughed in feature or getting that roughed in face, that roughed in form, it's kind of essential. So I've got my slant back right here. And then I've got the, the plane coming up over the eye. My forehead tapers back. My forehead's a little bit too large right now. I'm gonna need, I gotta take that down. And, and you'll see that the mouth makes kind of a wedge shape that comes up into the nose. So the, the mouth will form a wedge that goes up into that nose. And that's how you get the nostril on the side of the face rather than it just sitting straight on the front. Um, this looks very similar to something from there's a carving faces in wood and they carve a Native American um, face, I think, in cottonwood bark on, from the book, maybe by Wood Carvers Illustrated. I can't remember what company that is. But if you look at that, I, I kind of keep that rough out image in mind and some of the ones from like David Holtz and others um, as I'm roughing something in. But if you get a face and you can rough it in to, with the basic planes where you're showing the side plane 
the front plane of the head, that plane where it tucks back, moving into the hairline here. You've got your center line. You've got a basic taper here. You've got your eye sockets hollowed out. You can tell this is going to be a male figure because of how, pron how pronounced the brow is. Um, and, and you get that, then you've got those, the stark, more stark side planes coming in on this side of the head over here. Um, you get this plane up underneath here. If you get it carved down to that basic form, as you start to carve in the lips, the nose, the eyes, and you start to work your way up or down or across, if it, if it looks like this, it can't look too bad at the end because you will have had a basic human-esque form before you get started. One thing that I, I did a lot of whenever I first started was if you look back to that head that I showed you a minute ago, I would, I would carve in, I would just start carving in um, features to a flat face. And then I had this like flat effect with all these features laying up on the front of it. And it doesn't look realistic at all. You can tell it's a person, but it looks like a very um, elementary attempt at one. So getting in those basic planes of that head is kind of helpful. You can see a lot of times too, people have fat right there on their cheeks. And then it will, then your eye sockets, because you've got a hole there in the skull for your eyes to sit in, will the, the skin on that upper cheek will taper back. So these are some things I've picked up while drawing. You've got basically, as you, as you draw some lines in here, you get a change in value, a change in shading, which that change in shading shows us that, there is a, that so there's something happening up under the skin. So if you get your basic form roughed in here, and then you go through and, and there will be a slight shadow here. You see how I've rounded out this. Let me use pencil here. I've rounded out this right here. There will be a, there will be a slight change in the way the shadow falls right there. There's also one that comes up to the corner of the eye and it comes down just a little bit on the other side of that where there's gonna be a little bit of a change. You'll have, of course, a pretty stark indentation under here. You'll have a chin that'll sweep back. You'll have a darker spot here where the eyes, where the eye sockets are. Um, you'll have keystone on the forehead where it comes in and, and, and you can see that tapered down. Um, I think they call that the keystone. Um, and then you'll see the side planes and you'll see how it tapers down from the cheek here, which is something I'm not quite laid in on this guy. But I, I just wanted to get this rough face set in that way that I had a reference for you where you could be like, OK, if I can rough it down to this, then I can make it end up. This guy's going to end up looking pretty decent. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise and I don't get carried away and do something stupid. Um, he's going to end up looking pretty decent just because. This stuff is set in. And if I can compare that to say this, and I'm looking at it from different angles, I've got the basics of it aligned, and then I can come back through and I can put the details in. Um, but I guess that's me actually more doing less. Well, anyway, I'm just going to keep rolling. Um, lip junction rounded towards the tip, skull point. Don't core it. Oh, yeah, you're going to make adjustments on this back to that. You're going to make adjustments on this face the whole time you're working on it. So if you core out the nostrils here, then you don't have room to make any more adjustments on that nose. And I tend to adjust on that nose and sand on that nose the whole way through. So if I get that, if I just start, some people will say start with the nose. Don't don't just start with the nose. That's what I did for a long time and just kept messing stuff up. Um, if you start with the nose and you get a perfect nose, but everything else ain't right. You, you'll have to inevitably adjust somewhere else and then it throws off the proportion of how your nose is supposed to lie um, on that face. And then whenever you come back to like, like for instance, this right here in this book where it shows you, you know, the correct wrong, wrong. You see how much th there is very little difference in where that eye sits in relation to the bridge of that nose. But even that little amount is enough to where if you just core in this nose and you get you a perfect nose, then you get over here. And as you have to make an adjustment, you're off. So I save that the nostrils till last 
that way that I have the ability to make sure that all this around it's right before, because once I hollow that out, I, I can't work with it much. I don't have the room to fix it. Um, if, if I need to fix and troubleshoot later on as I, as I keep going. Um, the eye sockets, you want to sand those down before you start to carve those eyes in. Um, now, the eye, um, it's going to be sunken in a lot more here. And the, that eye socket actually tapers back just a little bit. But it's going to be sunken in a lot more here because you're going to have a rounded eye sitting in that socket. So some people like to make super deep eye sockets. And a lot of people don't like to make their eye sockets deep enough. You kind of got to find that balance. You can always take away more later, but um, if you make an eye that's just sitting flat on there, it'll look like the eye's sunken in and the person's going to look like a zombie. Um, a thing that I do with my eyes too, and this is small, large, whatever, um, I don't use a V-parting gouge to carve in eyes. Every time I use a V-parting gouge, I as much control as I like to think I have with a blade in my hand, it seems like every time I use a V-parting gouge, even a sharp one, I slip somewhat. Or if I'm using a knife, it'll it'll catch a, a tough spot in the wood or something like that, and I'll continue bringing it through, and then I'll slip and <laughs> cut way off over here. Um, what I like to do whenever I'm carving in those eyes is I like to point cut those in. And, and I'll start by getting my basic outline, and I'll just even take the, the tip of my skew, okay, on where that eye is supposed to be. And I'm not actually going to do it right now because it's not ready. And I'll draw in my line. As I'm drawing in my eye, I want to take I'm, – I'm right-hand dominant. Um, I want to draw in my left side first. That way that my hand's not getting in the way. Like, if I draw in my right side first, like it's natural for me, my hand's going to be getting in the way, and this eye's going to look one way, and this eye's going to look a different way, and it doesn't come out. But I want to draw in this one over here first. And as I draw that in, I want to take this and point cut in. And if I take just the very point and I roll it around, like, let me see if I can exaggerate that from down here. If I take that point and I stick it in there and then I roll it in, okay, along that line, then, then I can make that nice thick eyelid. The eyelid's actually a lot thicker than people think it is. So I, I can make that nice thick eyelid without slipping off there and, and tearing something else up. Um, the V-parting gouge, I don't, I don't like for that. Another little tool that I like to use whenever I'm working on eyes is, nope, this one, these two. I don't know what they are. This looks to me like about a number, number two, possibly a three. And this one might be a four and they're little bitty tiny um, palm tools that will fit in those ABS handles. Um, you can see the size. I don't know what millimeter that is. Let's see if I can hold it up there where you can see it, but it's really small. I use those things constantly because as I point cut in then, then I can use that to scrape away and then to work to round out that eye. And then using that skew, then I can get the corners of those eyes right. Um, so, if you're drawing, and another good practice to have is using your eye as a measuring tool. If you want to make a likeness of somebody, kind of understand how far the eye is away from something. So, the eye is this long, and I put my pencil up there, and I look at it, and then I can hold it down here, and then I can move it over here, and I can use that eye as a measuring tool if I don't have something like – or if you use calipers, it would be great to use that because then you can get it pretty exact, especially if you've got locking calip calipers. Um, so I've talked about now tools. I've talked about, I know it's been, it's probably been a lot. Um, I've never done this before, by the way. And I, and I hope that I've, that I've done good by you all. Um, Brian, it's, uh, about, we're actually at about an hour and a half. So, uh, if we can, I want to go ahead and open it up for some questions. Uh, that's perfect that kind of because I was at the end of my list and trying to work it to a conclusion. <laughs> this will be a good time to open it up for everybody. Does anybody have any questions for Brian today? I'm probably tired. I'm probably like my kids at school thinking, mercy sakes, <laughs> he worked this bell to bell. Hey, Brian. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Have you ever looked up Ruben Llanos on YouTube? No, but I will. 
He does very well. Oh, it's a Spanish spelling. So it's Ruben. Y-A-N-Y-A-N-I-S, right? Double double L. L. Spanish spelling, double L. L-L-A-N-O-S. A-N. He's a pretty good carver, and he uh, shows you a way to lay out the eyes symmetrically. He actually uh. shows them on tracing paper with a uh -huh. center section on the nose and then just flips it over. So your eye ends up exactly the same size and in the same orientation. That's pretty neat. Spell his last name for me one more time. Make sure I've got it right. Double L A N O S. Okay. Janos. Janos, thank you. I, uh, awesome. I found it very helpful. I got nice. a commission to carve 15 large Santa heads. And I was having a hell of a time with the eyes. I spent an entire Saturday just carving and recarving the eye uh -huh. with his video. I, I still don't really like my eyes a whole lot, but I'm working on them. I've only been at it about two years. Well, we're in the same boat then. Yeah. Um, I saw Alex LaCasse the other day had done a video on how to carve eyes. And I was looking for that. I think that's in, he may have a, He's got some type of master class thing that he does, and, and I need to figure it out because how to get on there and look at some of his stuff. I've got a code for it um, to, to do it. I just got to figure out technology is not my it's not my Mine strong is, suit. Mine is. Um, they had to tell me a little bit about how to do some of this stuff because we use Microsoft Teams at school. Um, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. Anybody hey, Brian, else another, another question from the chat, Brian. We've got somebody that's asking about the replacement blade from Flex Cut. Uh, they're wondering if over time the blade gets loose in the handle. So on one of the replacement blade, uh, yeah. I've never had that to where it caused me a problem. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember that ever being a bother to me. Um, so I've never really paid much attention to it. And I got, what got me started was at a, at a wood carving show. Um, the only one I've ever been to because COVID happened and then I've not been to any others, but, um, everything got canceled, but I picked up a deluxe starter set and it had one of those ABS handles in it and it was used before I got it. And I I still can't tell a difference. I don't, it's not like I have one that's caused me any trouble. So, I mean, I'm not going to say that it couldn't happen, but it just hasn't been a problem for me at all with, with using them. And then another question from the chat, how long did it take to carve the John Henry? I don't know. I don't keep track of my hours. Um, Whenever I carved John Henry, the only thing I had was a was a chainsaw, a Lancelot, a um, by King Arthur tools. If if you if you get one of those, be real careful with it. Um, a chainsaw, a Lancelot, a Dremel that um, was my grandfather's, and. I went and bought at that show a number nine, I think a number nine. Yeah, from Stubai. And that's that's what I had whenever I carved him. So if you look at like the lines on his arms that represent that CNC machine, like that was laid in with this right here. Um, I used, I had to learn to use all the different edges of this because it was the only chisel I had whenever I carved him. Um, he was looking a lot better before I I made a couple adjustments along the way that, that threw him off. And his nose was actually looking pretty good to begin with. But um but I don't know. I'm I'm gonna guess a month, month and a half. I don't know what it depends partly on what time of the year it was too. If I'm working before school and after school or if I've got Saturdays to work. Um 
I, I never keep track of my hours. I'm the guy that if I'm playing a pickup basketball game, I can't remember who's winning or losing. I can't keep track of the score either. Um, I always had another buddy of mine. There's always that kid on the court that knew exactly what the score was anyway, so I never had to worry about it though. And then they can uh, they can find your profile on Instagram under Rough Cut Craft. Yes. Uh, do you have a Facebook page as well? No, sir. I don't have a Facebook page. Um, okay. it, I've, I've only got Instagram. I, I don't have Twitter or anything else either. I've got some videos on YouTube. Um, if you look up Rough Cut Craft, you might find it under Flex Cut too, some of my videos. Um, I've got some videos of roughing it in and, and drawing that out. There's one um, where I'm carving a a, a portrait on there that that would be a really good resource for looking at a rough out yeah that's on there um there's somebody else that carves like people in wood and i'm sure you guys have seen his videos if you looked it up i think his name might be tito or something um but he carves like realistic portraits in in basswood and wow his stuff is it's pretty superb i've looked at him carving couple folks several times to watch the way that he does it all right well we're going to go ahead and uh stop you there brian and uh it's 20 to 5 eastern standard time now so uh, i want to thank you again for coming on with us today um you shared some great tips and resources and we'll make sure that we reference those down in the youtube page um make sure that you go out and like and subscribe that page uh if you haven't done it already and um, just a few things that will be coming up uh, here on International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, next week, we'll have Lucas Cost on. He's going to be talking to us about cottonwood bark carving. Uh, I'll actually be live on location with Dwayne Gosnell on February 27th. Uh, Dwayne's going to be doing a demonstration um, on study sticks. And uh, so I'll be there with Dwayne and helping him go through that process. On uh, March the 6th, uh, Rich. Embling's going to be coming back to talk about marionettes. Uh, March the 13th, Mary May of uh, Mary May's uh, Carving School of Traditional Wood Carving is going to be on. Uh, March the 20th, we'll have uh, Janet Cordell doing a demonstration. March 27th, we'll have James Ray Miller. Uh, on April the 3rd, we're going to have Tim Crawford come on and talk to us about uh, National Wood Carvers Association and Chip Chats. Uh, and then in April, we also have Alec Lacoste that's going to be on with us doing a demonstration, and Bruce and Kenny's going to be on. Uh, so we have quite a few things lined up. Uh, just make sure you tune in with us at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time each week on Saturday uh, for these great demonstrations. And again, go out uh, on YouTube, like and subscribe, uh, and uh, follow us on uh, Facebook and um, on Instagram. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Again, this is the International Association of Woodcarvers. And uh, we'll see you all next week at 3 p.m. Thank you.